But we also found that within the region that includes Oregon, Washington, Alaska, Montana, and Idaho, um, that there were 92 accused Jesuit priests and at least 80% of them worked in native or indigenous communities um, in the Pacific Northwest and also in Alaska. Hi, I'm Scott Edingham. Thanks for joining us here in the unique Northwest. Believe it or not, there is news out there beyond coronavirus and beyond the protests for racial justice. There's news all the time, in fact, and sometimes it gets overlooked. We are not going to overlook it today because there's a lot of news on the front of clergy sex abuse that's been going on for decades at this point, and it is relevant once again in the Northwest. And joining us to talk about some of her investigations of the past few years is Emily Schwing. Thanks for joining us today, Emily. Thanks for having me, Scott. Emily, so it's kind of a homecoming for you in some respects. You used to work for Northwest Public Broadcasting and the Northwest News Network, and you've continued your work on the clergy sex abuse front, the Jesuit order, and Gonzaga University in the time since you left. So we're going to talk about your recent investigation here in a minute, but let's just back up and have you catch up what you first uncovered a year and a half ago in this investigation. Yeah, so I was looking into the Jesuit order um, in the Northwest and in Alaska, and that's where I found out about these priests who had been retired to Gonzaga University's campus, a building called the Cardinal Bea House. And we found at least 20 Jesuit priests who had been accused of clergy sex abuse. Most of them retired and have been living on the campus of Gonzaga University as far back as 1986. They were relocated in 2015. But we also found that within the region that includes Oregon, Washington, Alaska, Montana and Idaho, um, that there were 92 accused Jesuit priests and at least 80% of them worked in native or indigenous communities um, in the Pacific Northwest and also in Alaska. Uh, we also found that the number of accused Jesuits in that region is uh, 3.6 times higher than anywhere else in the United States. Um, and we found accused Jesuits had worked in more than 100 native communities in the Northwest region. Um, since the 1940s at the very least. And fast forwarding to now, a recent investigation that you broadcast uh, in collaboration with the Reveal radio program, that showed a little bit more about Gonzaga University and the number of priests who had worked with Gonzaga who had been accused of misconduct over the past uh, several decades. Uh, what, what did that look like? Yeah, so I got really interested in this because right before we put out our first investigation, the Jesuit order released a list, an updated list of credibly accused priests um, from the Oregon province of the Jesuits. Um, and there was one priest whose name was not on that list who is listed on Bishop Accountability, which is an online database that tracks priests with allegations of sexual misconduct. Um, so I started digging a little bit into Gonzaga with some of the data that we'd already gathered from Bishop Accountability. And I found that among all 27 Jesuit universities in the United States, it is Gonzaga um, in Spokane that has the highest number of priests who not only have been accused of sexual misconduct, but who've also worked on staff uh, and or faculty there since 1940. We found 10 priests with credible accusations at Gonzaga. One is a diocesan priest and nine are Jesuits. We also found that there have been at least five lawsuits filed since 2004. All five of them originally named Gonzaga as a defendant. Um, also, all those lawsuits uh, allege sexual misconduct by priests associated with the university. All right, and let's dive into one of those priests in particular. His name is Brad Reynolds. He worked at Gonzaga in various capacities uh, over some years. Tell us about Brad Reynolds, what he's accused of, and where is he now? So Father Reynolds has been a Jesuit for many years. He would come and go from Alaska, but he was never officially assigned to work in Alaska. He visited a lot of villages. He's an amateur photographer and a writer. He would take pictures of village life in Alaska Native villages. And some of those photos and some of his writing were published in an article in National Geographic in 1990. Then in 2008, a lawsuit was filed against him. He is alleged to have sexually abused two boys between 1999 and 2000. And there are two other survivors who allege abuse earlier than that. Father Reynolds was put on administrative leave um, and he was investigated by the Jesuit order. However, the Jesuit order simply says that they found that the allegations against 
against him are not credible, but they won't give us details on how they came to draw those conclusions. We do know that when the Oregon province of the Jesuits filed for bankruptcy in 2009, the allegations of sexual abuse that were made in hundreds of lawsuits were sort of wrapped up into that bankruptcy process. The bankruptcy case was settled in 2011, and the four survivors who allege abuse by Father Reynolds are receiving payments from that bankruptcy settlement. A year later in 2012, after that settlement, uh, Father Reynolds was assigned to work as the Assistant Director of Mission and Ministry at Gonzaga University, where he ministered to students, offered them spiritual guidance, took them on retreats, um, and he worked there until the end of the school year in 2019, when he quietly left. We do not know why. There was no announcement made um, but he was a really loved priest. I mean, he even gave the commencement blessing in 2018. So as a part of your most recent investigation, you also looked at another story involving the accusations uh, against Father Bruno Sagata, who's not a Jesuit, but he was affiliated with Gonzaga University, and he's also a diocesan priest uh, in the Boise Diocese in Idaho. So tell us about his affiliation with Gonzaga and what the accusation is with Bruno Sagata, someone who I might even say is so revered, I, I guess is the right word, that he has a flight of wines named after him in Walla Walla. And a tasting room as well. There's a winery that's owned and operated by Gonzaga alum who attended Gonzaga's famed, I might say, study abroad program in Florence, Italy. And that's where he met Father Sagata. Bruno Sagata was a art professor. Um, he's Italian. He taught for Gonzaga University's study abroad program in Florence from 1982 um, until about 2009. Um, a woman named Lisa Hauser, who was born and raised in Spokane, alleges that he sexually assaulted her while she was a student on that program in 1991. Um, she has tried to lodge official complaints both with Gonzaga University and the Boise Diocese in Idaho um, at least half a dozen times. Um, however, she really doesn't feel like she's gained a lot of traction. Her relationship with Gonzaga is a little bit complicated. It turns out that she is the great niece and goddaughter of Myrtle Woldson, a well-known philanthropist and businesswoman from Spokane who gave Gonzaga University most of her estate in 2014 when she died. Lisa says that when she returned from the Florence program in 1991, she wrote a letter to um, then Gonzaga University President Bernard Coughlin uh, with you know her allegations. He called her into his office. Um, she says that he told her that if she went public with her allegations, he would reveal a dark family secret that he knew. Um, and so she didn't move forward for quite some time until 2003 when she heard that there was a big dust up at the Gonzaga and Florence program that involved Father Sagada. Gonzaga's administration that year did fly to Florence, attempted to fire Father Sagada. It looks like a lot of those decisions were being made because of some behavior that had come to light. There was a senior thesis written around that time that alleged that Father Bruno encouraged promiscuity, heavy drinking, lots of partying, lots of just debaucherous behavior that is unbecoming of a Catholic priest. However, there was a huge backlash from alumni and current students, and they decided to keep Father Sagata on until 2009. Um, and to this day, there's still a scholarship funded in his name. Um, last year, it was worth just under $120,000. And what has Father Bruno Sagata said in response to the allegations? Yeah, so I did try to call um, Father Sagata back in April. Um, we briefly, very briefly spoke. Um, I told him who I was. Uh, I told him about Lisa Hauser's accusations. Um, and before I could get anything else out, he told me that it was dealt with by the diocese years ago. And then he hung up the phone. What's interesting about this, Scott, is that Lisa Hauser received email from the Boise Diocese in 2018. Um, from the Boise Diocese Chancellor and Director of Child Youth and Adult Protection. His name is Mark Raper. Uh, the email is dated September 24th, 2018, and it says that uh, she need not worry because um, 
they wanted to let her know that the bishop had received her allegations, which they considered to be credible allegations um, of sexual misconduct by Father Sagata, that he would be retired on their website, that um, there would be an announcement made from the pulpit, and that Father Sagata was no longer allowed to participate in ministry in the Boise Diocese or anywhere else. However, somewhere after that, things changed. About two and a half months after that email was sent, I found out that Father Sagata had celebrated a funeral mass. And today he is presiding over three small churches in a parish in McCall, Idaho, which is about two hours north of Boise. Because of COVID-19, they're not having public gatherings, but they are posting um, Sunday mass on on the website of the church in McCall. And um, even this past Sunday, you could see Father Sagata celebrating mass. Of course, uh, an issue within the Boise Diocese, but then back to Gonzaga to wrap it up. You mentioned earlier that they had not really been very responsive to you and your multiple requests over several years to talk with them, especially with President Thane McCullough. Anything beyond that? What have they generally said in response, done in response, said to other news media? We'll just remember that uh, after your first investigation of a year and a half ago came out, two high-ranking Gonzaga officials resigned. Anything beyond that has happened? So last spring in April of 2019, Gonzaga announced that they had established a commission that would look into how the university can best respond to the clergy sex abuse crisis at large. I have requested a number of times interviews with the co-chairs on that commission. I've also asked about what the goals are for that commission. Um, I've been turned down for interviews, and I also um, really have not been provided with any sort of clarity on what the commission aims to do. Um, with respect to this latest story that we've put out, um, Gonzaga issued uh, what I would consider a pretty canned statement. It's less than 10 sentences um, that basically says they're deeply sorry for the pain experienced by all survivors of sexual misconduct, um, that the dignity of every individual is central to the mission and values of Gonzaga University, um, but they really have not said anything beyond uh, beyond that about um, their ties to both Father Brad Reynolds or Father Bruno Sagata um, and what they may choose to do in response in the future. Well, Emily, it's very good and thorough reporting. We thank you for doing it over the course of several years, and we thank you for joining us today. Thank you so much for having me, Scott. I really appreciate it. You can see more of Emily's work on these investigations at revealnews.org. And for more Northwest news, come to our website, nwpd.org. Thank you for joining us here in Unique Northwest. Mm -hmm.